So uh, Matthew chapter 16, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text up on the screens behind me uh, in a little bit. We also have some physical Bibles scattered around the room in little racks beneath the seats. If you don't own a Bible of your very own, don't have a copy of God's Word that you get to call your copy of God's Word, uh, we would invite you to take that physical one home. The reason that's real, real simple, we believe that God uses His Word for a number of lovely, awesome, amazing things, but the best and most lovely, awesome, and amazing is that He uses it to reveal Himself. He wants you to know Him. He wants everything in, about, and around your life to be shaped by knowing him, understood through the lens of knowing him, and if the scriptures are what he uses to do that in you, it puts you at a disadvantage if you don't have a copy. Um, and so take ours, go home and read it, and I believe that God will use it to just blow up your life in the best way possible. Um, so... We've made it now to the 29th week of our effort to walk through the gospel of Matthew together. Uh, Matthew is, as a gospel account, his job is to tell the story of Jesus and his work. And so his teachings, his signs and wonders, authenticating all of his teachings. Uh, but also he tells us of Jesus' sinless life, uh, his, of his atoning death on the cross to make payment for our sin, and of his resurrection again from the dead as a down payment of our own future resurrection or the future resurrection of his people. Uh, and what makes Matthew special among among the other three gospel accounts is that Matthew takes up that task by specifically looking at Jesus through the lens of the of Israel's promised messianic king, right? That's his angle. Uh, the, the one who is to come, who is who will reign forever and ever in perfect righteousness and perfect justice and perfect peace, right? And Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. Uh, and so his account is intentionally filled with a whole bunch of stuff that Jews around him uh, needed to hear and believe in order to trust that Jesus is everything he claims to be. Most of which is pointing back to a bunch of stuff in the Old Testament, uh, either by directly quoting the prophets or by drawing what would be called um, mediatorial allusions uh, to Israel's own story. Uh, but Matthew's not just playing games as some kind of disassociated narrator fiddling with how the story is perceived. That's not what's going on at all. Uh, no, Matthew has license to do this because, well, Jesus himself was making these same kind of claims. Over and over again, in fact, Jesus himself was walking around and saying things like he's God in the flesh. Like you got to deal with that. The ancient of days who was promised to come and deliver his people in perfect righteousness. Not just kind of halfway righteousness, not relatively more righteous. No, perfect righteousness. Jesus and the disciples are, are, are walking around uh, through an incredibly pagan place. We looked at this last week in Matthew chapter 16. Um, Peter's great confession, right? Uh, P- C- confessions are a public agreement to the truthfulness of something. And the biggest deal thing to ever be confessed took place last week, we saw, in Matthew chapter 16. And so Jesus and the disciples are walking around uh, in Caesarea Philippi, this incredibly wicked place, incredibly pagan place, a place renamed after a dead man posthumously declared to be a god. Caesar Augustus, the the imperial cult. And so Jesus spins around and he asks a question. All right, boys, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Ripped straight from the pages of the Old Testament book of Daniel, the Son of Man is a title given to someone who, who looks like God's people, but at the same time is not exactly like God's people because he's rightly and appropriately owed a glory that only God can be owed. Worship and obedience forever. It also appears that Jesus' favorite nickname for himself was the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of Man more often than he calls himself anything else. But right after asking a generalized question about you know, what the crowds think about him, what the crowd's opinion of him happens to be, Jesus presses that same question to his disciples specifically. Okay, but who do you say that I am? In other words, forget about everybody else right now. Our relationship with each other is not based on what everybody else thinks about me or what your spouse thinks about me, what your buddy thinks about me or your boss thinks about me. I'm not, I'm not looking for the opinion of the learned and the religiously astute right now. I'll deal with them when I choose to deal with them. I'm currently looking at you Who do you say that I am? Do you rightly see me as the Christ? Do you rightly see me as the son of the living God? And what we said last week is that Jesus is either right about those claims or Jesus is very, very wrong about those claims. 
He has not left a middle option available to us. Right? If, if Jesus is right, then he deserves to be worshipped and he deserves to be obeyed and he deserves to be followed with complete and utter submission. But if Jesus is wrong, then he deserves none of those things. He deserves to be rejected and forgotten and probably needs to be stopped before he harms someone. And so how you answer the who is Jesus question kind of matters more than any other question ever. Matters immensely because it will forever affect how you choose to live and will forever affect what you choose to chase after. It will will forever affect what you call success in this world. It, It reorients everything. So what was your answer last week, right? For those of you who are here, right? Is Jesus who he says he is or not? Or maybe you weren't here. Maybe you need to be asked that question now. Is Jesus who he says he is or not? Can you confess along with Peter that he's the Christ, the son of the living God? And you can't get away from that question. We try to dodge questions like that, but you can't really get away from that question because it, that question actually sits as the foundation of every other question in your life. Who do you say that Jesus is is always going to be there just underneath the surface of how you define the rest of the world and affecting everything else. And so we're going to see that fleshed out uh, as we get into our text for this week. Uh, But before we get there, I need to set up one other thing. Um, Last week, we looked at a text uh, that had the nickname, The Great Confession, right? Uh, And so, but there are actually four different places in Matthew's gospel, uh, uh, his account that are kind of tied together uh, with nicknames like that. And they all start with C letters. So it's the great C's, all right? And so in in order, they are the great confession, the great calling, the great commandment, and the great commission. And some of you are like, whoa, really? So I'll do it again, just in case you need to write that down. The great confession, the great calling, the great commandment and the great commission. So Matthew kind of strings these things along. And it just so happens that we looked at the great calling. uh, We get to look at the great calling this week. Looked at great confession last week. Right on the heels of that comes the great calling. So the obvious question is, well, what's a calling? Like, like some of you are from a generation that calling involves telephones. I've got an, I've got an app on my phone that says telephone. I rarely use it unless it's a spam call and I hit block. All right. Can't wait for November 5th. All right, so, all right. We're all there. We're all there. All right, so, so what is a calling? Well, a calling is a deeply buried sense of purpose. A deeply buried sense of purpose, a drive to be and to do what, you know, in order to fulfill what you've kind of been designed and set apart to be and to do. That's a calling. A calling can come from inside of you. Uh, that's probably the way that most people in our world think of it, try to define it. It's definitely the way that most secular people try to articulate callings, uh, but it's not limited to simply an internal thing. A calling can also be placed upon you. In fact, I, I happen to think that the best kinds of callings come from those who know you and want good for you. They understand how you think and they understand how you work. They understand uh, what situations cause you to, to flourish. And when an external calling comes from a self-sacrificial source rather than uh, some, something that's inherently selfish, uh, when, when those outward callings, man, they tend to, to push you towards something that's better than you oftentimes even want for yourself. You ever been in a situation like that? I've, I've been in some situations like that. It changed my life. And so out of all the callings that we could have for ourselves, and I don't know, I can imagine a lot of different things that people feel called to, um, feel and believe, or their purpose in this world. When I was in a seventh grade, I was convinced that I was going to be the world's first pro baseball player slash fighter pilot slash lawyer in my free time. Because, I mean, why not? I mean, how, how many hours do you have in the day? Um, anybody think I can still fulfill my dream? Is there time for me? But out of all the callings that we can have for ourselves, and for all the callings that those who love us could have for us, I think inquiring minds probably want to know what is the greatest calling ever? I mean, isn't that a good question? What's the greatest calling ever? What calling sits as higher and more lofty, more special and lovely than all other calls? And y'all are smart people. You know that there's a Christian answer to that question. And I'm sure you can probably guess that our text for the morning is actually going to answer that question explicitly. But I'm also willing to bet, I'm also willing to bet that that answer comes from a very different angle than you probably expect. 
comes out of nowhere. So we need to look at it. Matthew 16, we're going to look at verse 21. It says, from that time, time out. I know we only barely dipped our toe in the water, but something important just happened and we need to talk about it. All right. So what we have here is what's called a parenthetical statement of summary. Everybody sounds smarter now, right? Parenthetical statement of summary, meaning that it's a statement that steps outside of the timeline of the story, the regular flow of the story, in order to quickly explain what everything that's about to happen, all right? That's what's going on here, all right? So we see this in literature and all, all the time. You can probably pick out these moments in your favorite book. And so as the narrator of his gospel, Matthew steps out, Jesus kind of calls a time out, and he tells the reader what the reader needs to be looking for moving forward. And so we, call, we talked about the same idea all the way back in February, for those of you who remember that far back, uh, when we were dealing with chapter four of Matthew. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's a very, very, very rare moment. All right, in fact, this is the second of only two times that Matthew uses this kind of literary device. Uh, structurally speaking, uh, we've kind of been working through uh, a literary framework, a structure uh, to breaking Matthew's gospel up into s- essentially seven pieces. All right? And so those of you who have been here for the length of this series, uh, you, you, you've seen it. Uh, but there's an introduction and then there are five discourses of Jesus' teaching that are kind of... Uh, uh, bunched together and then immediately following those discourses are a bunch of uh, uh, stories kind of articulating and illustrating uh, the teaching that Matthew uh, that Jesus just did and then uh, so you got the introduction and then the five and then you have kind of a um, an exaltation of the king so seven basic sections to the gospel of Matthew but that's not the only way that you can break up Matthew you can do it some other ways some people prefer to see the book of Matthew as a story occurring in three acts all right And so act one is Matthew introduces us to the king. But in Matthew 4, 17, we're told that from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at what? Hand. You remember that. And Matthew's point in that moment is to show uh, that the situation and the focus of Jesus's work has shifted. There's something new going on. And so from that time, Jesus is dedicating himself to a specific task, a specific work uh, that, that can be summarized by that statement. He's calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So chapter four, that task is a, a repentance call, uh, to repent of their sin, to, to follow him. He's gathering a crowd to himself, right? And then in chapters five through the first half of 16, uh, Matthew spells out how Jesus does that. And so Matthew uses that exact same phrase from that time here again. So it means we're moving on to act three. Jesus's situation and focus are shifting once again. So he's no longer in the mode of gathering people to himself through repentance call, through working miracles. What's he doing now? What's the new summary task that Jesus is supposedly committing himself to? Well, let's keep reading verse 21. It says, from that time... Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. All right, so right after focusing the question to his disciples, right, what just happened, right after getting their verbal confirmation that they are indeed on board with the belief that Jesus is exactly who he claims to be, even right after kind of pumping them up about attacking the gates of hell, right, with that revealed truth. Jesus, Jesus seems to intentionally shift his tone here. He seems to intentionally shift what's going on. He just kind of plants a foot in the ground and he turns on it, which is weird because like, like I, I've, been, I've been in church leadership and some kind of ministry for a long time. That's usually not the way that this game gets played. Right? Uh, like, like this seems, it feels like it's supposed to be a hit the gas pedal kind of moment for Jesus, right? Uh, there's a bunch of people who are on board. The truth of who I am is going to change the world. Even the gates of hell can't stop us, boys. Charge, right? But that's not what Jesus does. He instead begins speaking about dying and about the suffering he must endure. Is must the right word there? Must endure. Matthew just summarizes this teaching here, but Jesus expands on it a lot more in the next few verses, and he also spells it out in in further detail in chapter 17, and then chapter 20, and then chapter 26. The Christ must be rejected. He must die by crucifixion. He must rise again from the grave. But, But why? Why all the musts? 
Well, it's because those are the actions that fulfill all the, the promises about him in the Old Testament. That's why must. I told you last week that Matthew ain't cherry picking here, that Jesus, Jesus is ticking all of the boxes, even the ones that are a little uncomfortable. So once Jesus gets everybody on kind of locked down on the reality that he is truly the Christ, the son of the living God, once everybody's supposedly settled on that issue, he goes right to work making it explicitly clear what the Christ, the son of the living God, actually came to do. Guys, the gospel isn't a choose-your-own-adventure story. That's not what's going on here at all. Jesus came for a specific purpose and that purpose was to reconcile a people to himself through his own death and resurrection and this reality while while clearly prophesied clearly promised by God to his people in the old testament it's it also seems to be disconnected from the assumptions that most people had about the christ most people had about jesus specifically uh, it, it's it's disconnected from what a lot of people wanted the Christ to, to be. And we see that disconnect begin to play out in verse 22. It says, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Verse 23, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So, Peter, man, he tries to help Jesus out. No, nah, man, that ain't gonna happen to you. You can just imagine Peter pulling Jesus to the side, talking all quiet. Hey, buddy, you know I love you, right? You don't have to talk so down like that. Why are you doubting yourself? No, you got this. Drop all this negative talk. There's no way that bad stuff is gonna ever happen to you. And I think we would all assume, I think we'd all assume that Peter's intentions are probably good in this moment. I feel like I would probably try to do the same thing that Peter did if I were in his sandals. Um, but then again, Jesus corrects him by calling him Satan. So, whoops. <laughs> best case scenario here, like the best way I can imagine this playing out is that even if Peter is genuinely trying to encourage Jesus, he's still ignorant. Hopelessly ignorant. Because while there are a number of Old Testament promises, uh, prophecies that describe the Messiah as a coming king, there are just as many that describe him as a suffering servant. As one who will ultimately bring healing to his people by his own pain. Whether Peter means good by it or not, Satan definitely appears to use that ignorance in this moment to put genuine temptation in front of Jesus. He said, no, nah, you don't. You really have to go with the, through with all this cross stuff, right? All that sacrifice for sin nonsense. Surely you can get to that celebrated and exalted place as the Christ, the Son of the living God, with all that man of sorrows acquainted with grief stuff. We don't have to do that. Forget about the whole dying thing. There's no need for the cross. We can get you where you need to go without all that stuff. Hear me, National Baptist Church. Jesus fulfilling only half of what he came to do would make him an insufficient savior. He's not good enough if he didn't come to die. A Jesus who comes in power without also coming to lay down his life cannot pay the debt of our sin. But Peter's not the only one who's ever tried to help Jesus out. I've been guilty of that too. Maybe you have. We hold him up against the framework of our sensibilities. We to discreetly trim away doctrines that are a little problematic right now. Bad PR, whatever. Most of the time, though, we do exactly what Peter did. We celebrate and chase after victory, quote-unquote, while trying to hold suffering at arm's length. No, we don't have to deal with that part. But Jesus rebuked this misunderstanding in Peter, and, and not politely either. They were close to politely. So, so where does Jesus come off calling people Satan? Is that... Seems mean. I'd get in trouble with that. My mom would call me the next morning. Right. Well, we discovered in pretty clear terms last week that an a la carte Jesus cannot save you. He's powerless. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you ever really thought about it. It's actually a really smart strategy on Satan's part to let people have all of the partial make-believe Jesuses they want just so long as they never actually put their trust in the real one. It's a great game plan. 
Anything that replaces Jesus' glory with some ineffective knockoff is by definition satanic. And so no, it's not mean. Jesus is not being rude here. Jesus is calling out precisely what's going on in this moment. This is a real temptation here. And he says, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on man-made inferior wannabe kingdoms. And Peter, that's not the kind of kingdom I'm building here. The Christ, the the son of the living God, he came for a a specific purpose. He came to intentionally be rejected. He came to suffer. The Bible makes it explicitly clear, clear. He came to die for our sin. Oh, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I mean, I'm glad he did that and all. I mean, that's like a past tense thing, right? That's, that's filed away. I mean, I'm personally very happy that Jesus didn't allow Peter or anybody else to sidetrack what he came to do uh, and that we now reap the amazing benefits of all that Jesus' death and resurrection accomplished. Awesome. Um, but, but what does that have to do with us right now? And when are we going to get to start talking about our, our, our sense of calling? Because I was kind of getting excited about that. Really wanted to talk about me more. Well, to get there, there are two truths that I think we need to deeply understand. The first one is this. The calling, the driving purpose, the thing set out for and specifically created to accomplish driving purpose for the greatest man in history. Anybody want to argue with him? It was to come as a suffering servant, destined to die at the hands of those who opposed him greatest man it was his calling and I think we all assume or at least I tend to assume maybe you're better than me but I think we all tend to assume that that greatness is automatically defined as as by some kind of earthly version of success that that without victory and celebration then the things are necessarily the opposite of good let alone great right but Jesus intentionally chose a different measuring stick He could, I mean, let's think through the the hypotheticals here. He could have gathered a large crowd to himself. He could have worked a couple of miracles to, you know, make a show of things. He could have gone on from there to just prop up his feet and set himself up as the unparalleled, unmatched, like eternal king. Like nobody's messing with Jesus. it's It's not hard for him. All that was well within his reach. He could have had every bit of it. But the great greatest man had a great goal. He had an ambition that looked beyond our petty definitions of earthly greatness, didn't he? An ambition that laid himself down so that he might save many. And so the natural question that flows out of that is, what are you chasing after? You think, you think Jesus' ambitions were too small? You think he had inferior goals you think he missed his opportunity to go get him some of what would be truly worthy of our celebration or do you think that the christ the son of the living god stepped onto the scene with a greater goal than what comes naturally to you and me who do you say that the son of man is But there's a second truth that we need to understand if we're going to rightly understand our calling, right? And that truth is found in verse 24. It says, And then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. All right, so trace the pathway of Jesus' logic here. He says, If you really want to follow me, then you're going to have to suffer like me. That's fun, right? He says, Take up your cross. And so what does that mean? I said a few moments ago that Jesus kind of makes this new effort of speaking of his coming death from verse 21 on. But while he certainly ramps up the cross messaging moving forward, it's not the first time he's brought it up. All right? uh, those of you who have been around through the length of this series, you remember that Jesus introduces the idea of the cross back in chapter 10 in, in the second discourse. In fact, he says something there that on first reading sounds way more harsh. He says, whoever does not take up his cross is not worthy of me. Not worthy of Jesus. Thought everybody's supposed to be worthy of Jesus. So that raises a question. What, what do the disciples hear and think when Jesus starts talking like this? Because uh, we can be honest, right? It's a weird thing to talk about. 
It's kind of a weird thing to say. Maybe it's a question you've encountered before. Maybe it's not something you've ever really committed any time thinking through, but it's an important question. Uh, and it's an important question because when you and I, when we hear the word cross, we immediately kind of pour a lot of uh, religious symbolism on top of that, right? Like even amongst like non-Christians in our culture, the Christian story still kind of permeates enough to, that even the, the committed secularist kind of knows the major pillars of the story, Right? Many may not know why the cross is a thing. They can't speak intelligently about all the implications of the cross. So why Jesus had to die, what what it actually accomplishes and so forth. But most people, I think, still kind of understand that the cross is a Jesus thing and that Christians make a big deal out of it and we decorate our churches with it and stuff. Even though they don't understand that themselves, they, they attach it to what we're doing here. But in the scope of world history, that, that's a relatively modern understanding of a cross. And the most famous thing to ever happen on a cross hadn't happened yet by Matthew chapter 16. There's no culturally understood religious meaning buried in that symbol when Jesus starts talking about this. And so when the disciples start listening to Jesus talk about a cross, they're, they're standing there with confused looks on their face as Jesus goes on and on and on, glowingly talking about one of the world's most gruesome execution tools. And if you spent much time in church, you've probably sat under a pastor or two sometime, somewhere com- who compared the, the first century cross to our modern notions of electric chairs and lethal injection and those kinds of things. And for good reason, too. You know, the cross was absolutely used for state-sanctioned executions. That's what it was for. But at the same time, they're not the same. They're not the same. The, the, the cross and things like lethal injection are actually worlds apart because regardless of whatever you believe about capital and pun- capital punishment, we can, I think we all at least need to agree that we're making some attempt, at least a level of attempt at executing criminals in a relatively humane way. But that wasn't the goal of the Roman cross. They're not looking for humane in that moment. The cross was explicitly about executing someone in the least humane way possible. The cross was what Rome used when it wanted to make a statement, when it wanted to send the message uh, that this is what happens when you're dumb enough to mess with Rome. Try it again. And here comes Jesus, man. Boys, unless you take up your own gruesome execution tool and follow me, you're not worthy of me. Oh, you're, you're, you're locked in on me being the Christ, the, the son of the living God? Great, awesome. Oh, by the way, if you're gonna actually follow me, then you must deny yourself and pick up your cross too. Orientations at five, see you there. There have been moments in church history that have tried to explain this text away as Jesus just using exaggerated, hyperbolized language to, to teach that you know following him is probably gonna cost you something something that's dear to you, that following Jesus might be slightly difficult. There have been countless examples of people trying to liken the cross to heaven to give up things that they hold dear, things that they would prefer to chase after, endure some westernized form of hardship that usually ends up in them missing out on some opportunity somewhere. Some groups have even gone as far as to try to argue that um, the, the difficult thing is to proverbially give up on your wish list because Jesus wants a better wish list for you. The folks saying that are usually on late night TBN and have bigger hair than I'll ever have. Uh, but, but based on what's actually in the text, like based on what we're seeing on the page, I, I think there's about a 0% chance that the disciples think that Jesus is exaggerating. Confused? Absolutely. I think they're lost right now because who would actually want something like that? Sounds backwards and upside down. Who in their right mind would willingly lean into such a thing? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? But I don't, I don't think it's some weird bent towards self-harm. That's, that's not what's going on at all. I think Jesus deeply understands that his kingdom and all of the kingdoms of this world are diametrically opposed to each other. That they are intentionally running in opposite directions. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Maybe you've been paying attention, maybe you haven't. Uh, But our world doesn't tend to like it when it's kind of confronted with otherworldly ethics. Has it ever popped up in your newsfeed? 
the values and the priorities and the postures of Jesus' kingdom, they stand in stark contrast to the cultures and systems we're surrounded by, right? And when those conflicts happen, and they happen every single place that Jesus' kingdom shows up, when those conflicts happen, the world does not respond to that conflict with apathy, with a lack of caring. No, it typically responds to that conflict with either ridicule or rage. Ridicule or rage. And we, t- we talked about that reality quite a bit over the last several months, right? And over and over and over again, Jesus has made it just absolutely clear that he is establishing a kingdom that is intentionally upside down from the kingdoms that we're living in. The, the citizens of his kingdom will likely be persecuted for following him. That's not, a, that's not a maybe, it's a promise. Now, if you're a Christian, and it should be pointed out that we are blessed to follow Jesus in a place in the world, in a time in here, history where persecution usually leans more towards the ridicule side of things instead of the rage kind of things. We should be thankful for that. Celebrate God's goodness and wisdom in giving us that. Thankful that following Jesus in our context isn't as costly as it is in other times and other places. Absolutely. But it should also be said out loud and often that that has not been the reality for the majority of Christians across most of the world, across most of history. We live in a unique time. And listen, odds are that we may one day live in that kind of context again soon. Our suffering, our cross-bearing probably won't rise to the level of actually dying. But it could. It's not out of bounds. God would not be mean for allowing that to happen, for not protecting us from that. He doesn't promise any such thing. Or perhaps God may call you one day to, to take the gospel somewhere where that is the present reality. Would he be glorified in that? I think he would. But listen, Even if cross-bearing means something less than physical suffering or death, it will certainly mean more than comfort and ease. And so make no mistake, when Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, he must take up his cross, it may not be literal, but it's far from an exaggeration. It is a call to go ahead and reckon yourself as already dead to this world as you follow him. I told you last week that the first question never goes away. Last week's question is still under the surface here. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if Jesus isn't every single thing he claims to be, then what are we doing here? The call, the call would be ludicrous, right? You would obviously be out of your mind to follow him if Jesus isn't actually everything he claims to be. Either Jesus is imminently worthy of your entire trust and your entire worship and your entire obedience and your entire submission, or Jesus should be regarded as a dangerous fool. Who do you say that I am? But there's something else here that we kind of skipped over, didn't talk about it, but it's there. Jesus doesn't just say, take up your cross. He also says, deny yourself. It's got a slightly different color to it, right? And church, I'm actually convinced that this is the really hard part. The cross part, easy in comparison to the deny yourself part because (laughs) you and I were born in this place. We are born into the world that Jesus' kingdom is set against. We are products of it, which means that we naturally live and we naturally think and we naturally act as if this world is obvious and right. So the very first disconnect isn't actually dying to the world, it's dying to ourself. Dying to what seems easy and even natural to us as we trust that Jesus' way is better. People who have chosen to follow Jesus, man, they're being yanked out of old kingdoms and it's, it's, not, a, it's not a soft yank. <laughs> and those old kingdom ways and those old patterns and those old assumptions, they don't just magically go away, they, they, they die hard. So we've got to be retrained to kind of think consistently with Jesus' kingdom and to value what he values. And we've got to slowly and just kind of faithfully reorient every single cell of our life and body to live towards a kingdom that's moving in the opposite direction of what everyone else is chasing after. And that begins with with grace-filled decisions that you are no longer in charge of you. Do you have a king And he's infinitely wiser than you will ever imagine yourself being. 
And that even when you don't see it yet and you can't feel it, it feels like it's too far away, you trust that his ways are good and righteous and leading you to beauty. Church, there's no version of following Jesus that does not involve dying to you. It's just not there. It doesn't exist. Yes, dying to your sin, but also dying to your old ambitions and dying to your old aspirations, dying to the way that you thought your life would go. You want to know, you want to know what your calling is, Christian? You want to know what the, the great calling is for each and every Christian to ever live? It actually hasn't changed since the day that Jesus uttered it out of his mouth right here. It is to figure out that Jesus' kingdom is better than every other option available to you and then to go give your whole self to it. That's your great calling in this world. Will that commitment be difficult as you learn to see and value what he sees and values? Yeah. Deny yourself. Will that commitment receive ridicule from those on the outside who don't understand it? Yeah, probably so. Almost certainly. Will it receive rage? Maybe. But follower of Jesus, the call is to take up your cross like your king did. Die to yourself, die to this world, and go. Okay, Woodard, but I mean, that sounds really hard. <laughs> like, do I actually get something out of this deal? Well, I told you earlier that the best kinds of callings come from those who know you and want good for you. They, they come from self-sacrificial sources, and they lead you towards better things than you sometimes even want for yourselves. And, and so uh, I hope it's not a shock to you to learn that Jesus actually promises an otherworldly and eternal reward for those who take the deal. Look at verse 25. This is something we're going to talk about a lot more detail as we get deeper into Matthew, but Jesus is going to start dropping some hints for us here. Verse 25 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, so the, the upside down nature of Jesus' kingdom that he means that he both kind of measures and rewards things on an entirely different scale than what the rest of the world around us attempts to measure and reward things. And Jesus frames that difference in two distinct ways, and both of them kind of showcase just how ridiculous and lopsided this trade actually is. The first way is that he shows that things of earthly value are not necessarily the same things that are of eternal value. There's some overlap in that Venn diagram, sure, but they're not the same. He says that it's possible to spend your whole self chasing after something that this world considers to be probably the most important thing ever. But in the end, it costs you something that is of actual eternal value, your soul. Meaning, you can literally gain everything in this world, money, power, fame, you can own every bit of it. But if you have to trade your spiritual life in order to get it, then you lose. You lose. Your pile of things and influence can indeed be bigger than everybody else's pile of things and influence. But when you compare that pile to the eternally valuable diamond of Jesus' kingdom and his citizenship, your pile is discovered to be nothing but fodder. Have fun with it. When you stand before the judge of all the earth, and make no mistake, you will one day stand before the judge of all the earth. He will not care what number is in your bank account. And he won't care how much power you consolidated. And he won't care what others think about your celebrity. The only, uh, the only question that will matter on that day is, did you confess my son as the Christ, the son of the living God? Yes or no? Money, power, and fame, they're not inherently evil things. If God gives you those things, awesome. Use them for his glory and for others' good. Leverage them, awesome. But to spend your life chasing those things instead of chasing Jesus is a losing strategy in an eternal game. Who cares if you attain all of those things, but you lose out on what's actually valuable? Of course, second and, tier, second and third tier things, man, they have their place. No one says otherwise. The problem comes when we elevate them to first tier things. When we define ourselves by them. Jesus says that's a terrible game plan. You're playing for the wrong goal line. The king will not be impressed with you. And if, and if that's the strategy you want to go with, good luck with that. The Bible is pretty clear how he will handle 
those things on that, when that day comes and those who love them more than him. But there's a second way that Jesus frames how ridiculous and lopsided the trade is. He also shows that this world has an expiration date. That there's a closing of history. And the reality is that this world is incredibly busy chasing after things that cannot last. You don't have to act like you don't see it. Like our local city dump is full of trinkets and treasures that were Christmas presents two years ago. Right? You know people who have committed their entire lives to chasing after a claim and something that when all said and done, they, they kind of wish they could take it back because they gave up too much to get it. And so a prioritizing of those things over what Jesus has actually called his people to prioritize. It's not, it's not only a losing strategy. The Bible would describe it as a foolish strategy, a recklessly wasteful one because you can't keep it. It's all going to fade away and be forever forgotten, including intangible things like power and fame. There's coming a day when no one alive will remember your name. How often have you lost sleep worrying about what someone else is thinking about you? How often have you upended and rearranged your life around trying to gain some material thing? How often have you harmed someone else because you, it allowed you to move up one step on some dumb social ladder? Or am I the only one that's done things like that? Hear me clearly. There is a freedom in Jesus' kingdom that all the kingdoms of this world can never offer to you. Earthly kingdoms make lots of promises, but they can never promise that. Jesus offers you eternal priorities and eternal satisfaction. He offers you an eternal rest that, that, that frees you from the petty burdens of performance and pecking order. You don't need those things in his kingdom. And so just like we saw last week, I've got a question for you this morning. Um, Follower of Jesus, I'm going to assume that you've already confessed greatly. I'm glad you've got that filed away. But now that you've confessed greatly, you have a great calling in front of you. Here's my question. Will you actually follow him? Even if it's costly. Especially if it's costly. Jesus makes it crystal clear. If you would come after him, it might even be deadly. You will have to deny yourself. You will have to live as though as already dead to this world. But the reward, man, the reward is truly great. Your lost friends and family, they, they, won't, they won't understand. You want to know why? It's because you're chasing and aiming after a different finish line than them. They can't understand. They don't have the, the capacity to understand because you're running an entirely different race than they're running. But you will have an eternal reward that Jesus promises will blow away everything you gave up to get it. Diamonds versus fodder piles. And so either Jesus can deliver on that promise or he's not worth following at all. What do you say? I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. It's a time that we set aside each week to give you space to respond, to put some kind of action to uh, action step to what we're talking about here. If you want to talk to someone, I'm, I'm here for that. But what about those of you who are not followers of Jesus yet? How can you respond this morning? Well, here's a question for you. Have you, grown, have you grown tired yet of chasing after what everybody else spends their time chasing after? I mean, it feels exhausting, right? It's because it is exhausting. Have you, have you come to, to figure out that those things never actually deliver on the promises that they try to deliver? King Jesus wants a better for you than that. He's offering you a better way, and he proves that by first giving you himself. The Bible teaches that because of our sin, we are all separated relationally from God, that we are owed the just and right punishment for sin. The Bible sometimes calls that punishment hell. But the Bible also teaches that God is rich in mercy and that he loves us with a great love and that even when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, he makes us alive through the grace of Christ. He, how does he do that? He sent his son, he put on flesh, and he dwelled among us. He lived sinlessly that, in a way that you and I can't accomplish. He died on a cross as an innocent substitute to make payment for your sin. He was raised again from the dead as a vindication of his own perfect and sufficient righteousness. And now as the king who conquered sin and death, he calls on you to respond to him in repentance and faith, to turn away from your sin and to turn to him as Savior and Lord. And you can do that today, man. I'd love to be helpful. You want to talk? We can talk. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe it's by time for you to formally join our church family. Or maybe it's time for you to uh, finally be obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized. Or maybe you need to make public some call he's put on you to take the gospel somewhere far away from here. I'd love to help you figure that out.
But whoever you are and however God's word is calling you to respond this morning, let's all respond together right now. Father, you're good to us. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for a great calling. It's not for the faint of heart. It is a sober calling. You've called for us to give up everything in following you, maybe even life itself. But you've also promised great reward. And you're either a promise keeper or you're a promise breaker. I'm convinced that you keep promises. For those in here who don't know you yet, would you make yourself known? Reveal yourself and your character, your goodness, your faithfulness to those who don't know you yet. Open eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to know you. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.